I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. We Yesterday on the show, we talked about a barista who wanted to move to Nicaragua and get away from the rat race and came up with some ideas of where he may want to work and what he may want to look at doing. And one of the things we talked about was something that involved being on a phone, kind of like a call center. And Patricia had some concerns about using VOIP in a place like Nicaragua and that that may be just like people who were in Houston during the hurricane cut off from electric. And a lot of people, not a ton in reality, but a number of people lost their jobs because they didn't have power. They didn't live in a reliable enough place and they were unable to keep working during a major storm. So is that a risk if you're going to be doing that from Nicaragua? Today, I want to talk about why Nicaragua, outside of any legal or political uh, concerns, like rules from your business about where you're allowed to work, which we've had lots of videos talking about why you don't discuss that with them in most cases. But beyond that, from a purely technical or business perspective, why Nicaragua may be the ultimate place to be doing call center work. For real, that is the location for that. We're going to explain why right after that ball. Let me give a little bit of background before we start today's discussion. First of all, I run companies that do call centers and make telephone systems. So this is very much my wheelhouse. VOIP is something I've been doing as an engineer for about 23 years. So this is an area I know a lot about. Also, I want to preface or, or give a little contextualization around what we mean by Nicaragua being the, to contextualize a little bit, what we mean by Nicaragua being the ultimate place for doing uh, call center work is one, we're assuming that the call center work is being done to North America. So working to or from the United States or Canada. So you, a proximity both in time zone and in physical distance, allowing for proper uh, packet travel time and latency between Nicaragua and the places where you're using uh, the calls, where the calls are terminating. So uh, this is something that people don't often think about when they're talking about doing offshoring or nearshoring of calling systems, but the physical distance that packets need to travel down the wire matter. And Nicaragua is well within the zone where you get the highest quality audio back to the United States. So someone calling from Nicaragua sounds exactly like someone placing a call from the United States. Uh, there's no loss, there's no latency, there's no problems caused by that. Whereas if you were dealing with something in, for example, Southeast Asia, uh, you the physical distance for the wires can be not a major problem, but can be detectable when speaking on the line. So Nicaragua falls into that, that first tier for North America. If you're doing the same thing, call centers to Europe, then Nicaragua would not be ideal. The time for the packets to reach Europe are just a little bit longer and you might hear the, the degradation in call quality over that distance. It would still be pretty good, but it wouldn't be in that first tier of optimum audio quality. So what exactly makes Nicaragua ideal for working in call center type jobs? Now, before I actually get into that, there's always something I wanna say, and that is that finding workers in Nicaragua for call center works, workers for English speaking countries in North America can be a very big challenge. So that is something that people often face as they're looking at opening call centers here so they can hire Nicaraguan workers. And that's wonderful, however, there are uh, a very large number of call centers that are already here and the number of Nicaraguans who are qualified to work in those call centers who have the interest, the aptitude and speak English is mostly a saturated market. So if that's something you're looking for, be aware that you will be getting into a market where you will be increasing these salary rates because you will have to pay above current market rates in order to poach those people from existing companies. There really isn't an open space for that specific skill set. There's a million things that you can hire Nicaraguans to do and you could open call center training facilities that teach English and other skills, that's fine. But if you are looking for call center workers who are Nicaraguan, you're going to have a bit of a challenge. Please do so. It is a great thing to help bolster the economy here. But don't think that this is an untouched market that you're going to come into and that there's a million available workers. That's not at all the case. Existing companies are advertising all over the country all the time and hiring every single available person because it is already such a booming industry that they have depleted the available market of workers. But if you're looking at moving into the region and looking to move workers who are already working in North America, and are simply going to be based here, or you're a call center worker from North America who wants to change their place of residence to here so that you can take advantage of the weather, the relaxed lifestyle, not needing to commute, lower cost of living, and so forth, then this is going to be ideal for you. So that's really what we're talking about. There's 
a lot of different potential aspects, but we're just talking about the ability to do that work from here. Now, the things that Patricia had brought up that she was concerned about, one of them was power. Isn't VOIP heavily in, uh, impacted by power, and doesn't Nicaragua have power problems that would impact it? Not that it's bad, but isn't it having a lot of electrical issues? So the first thing is the electrical issues between Nicaragua and the United States are very different, and one of the things that's really significant is that in the United States, you tend to have power issues that cripple call center work, and in Nicaragua, we tend not to. In all the years that I've lived in Nicaragua, never once have we experienced an event that should really impact the ability to do call center work. Whereas when I lived in the United States, it was still not common, but it did happen. And she immediately had an example of people just last month who in Houston lost their jobs because of large scale power. And she didn't mention this, but this goes with it. Internet outages on a massive scale. So there was no ability for people to cover for each other. So they had to wipe out whole areas of, of employment, uh, but they were gone for days at a time or weeks at a time. Here in Nicaragua, the longest outage that we've ever experienced in all the time that I've been here is not so long as to overrun a good battery system. And uh, here it is very common. And remember, your cost of living is much, much lower. So if you should need, I do not have this, but some people do as they have generators and can go to generate uh, their own power and can go indefinitely. Of course, you can do that in the United States too. No one's saying you can't, but it is generally much cheaper. Here, people do it for about $450, $500, have a generator, have some fuel standing by, go off of uh, liquid petroleum and are able to run for days at a time off of that. We've never had to do that. We've never had an outage of greater than like uh, 12 hours. And it's been a couple of years since we've had any stretching that long. It was all during the construction of the new hospital. Now that that's being hooked up, we were supposed to have a really major outage just the other night. Never happened. We've had no long outage uh, of a significant portion of time uh, in quite some time here, uh, but we do have tiny outages all the time, but tiny outages really don't affect VOIP. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons that people think if this is the case, long ago, if you're older than, say, 35, you're probably used to the old landline era when power was delivered over the phone lines. We got this impression that the phones were more reliable than the electrical system because the phones got their own power. When the electrical grid would go down, the phones would keep working. The electrical needs of the phone system did not fluctuate or vary minimally, whereas the load on the regular system would fluctuate during different times of day, during different times of year, weather events, whatever, right? Turn on air conditioning, you're sucking a lot more power than if you're not using air conditioning. So a change in one degree in temperature, just a hot day could mean a 50% increase in the total load on the grid. Whereas phones, whether you're on the phone or not on the phone, ringing or not ringing, doesn't really change how much power is being used very much. Phones are much more predictable and have lower voltage. So phones had a tendency to keep working even when the power was out. Or more importantly, they would work even if the power was out. Sometimes the phones would go down and the power would not, right? There were just two independent systems and you had to supply the power uh, to the phones independently. So uh, if the phones went down, having power wouldn't protect you. But if you had uh, uh, power, the phones, you know, or if you lost power, you would not necessarily lose phones. So it was simply a different thing. So we didn't connect the two events together, even though phones went down relatively often. Now, today with VOIP, you don't get power through the line to your phone. So you have to provide your power locally. This is not better or worse, it's just different. So just like the old phone system had to have a backup in case the power grid went down, they would generate their own power and keep everyone up and running. Of course, they had blips potentially when they cut over to the generators, but you didn't notice them because you probably weren't on the phone at the moment that that happened or you expected something to happen at that moment. And so it wasn't a big deal. Today, you have to provide that yourself just on a very small scale. So you can do this with a UPS or uninterrupted power supply, something that everyone is using a desktop or having an office at home should have anyway because this is how you protect your equipment. It's not a specialty thing just for people who are uh, doing call center work or anything of the sort. Anybody who's got a video game machine or going to be uh, working from a home office or just has important computer equipment that they don't want to be at additional risk or data that they don't want to put at risk of losing because they're working on it and the power goes out, you should have a good UPS. A lot of people just refer to this as a battery. So with a good battery, you are not impacted by small power events. Now, in a cheap battery, you may get, say, five minutes. It's just enough that if there's a drop in power, you have time to shut down your computer and be like, okay, I'm done working, but I was able to keep myself from losing data. This would also keep a call going long enough for you to say, okay, I, I got to go. I'm losing power. 
If it's your home office and you want to keep working, you simply put in a bigger battery for the amount of time you want to endure being able to be down. For us, because I work from home and it's super important and I want to be able to keep doing my video editing and all that kind of stuff, we have a battery that lasts about 12 to 14 hours. We actually don't know how long it'll go, but it's so large and handles so much stuff that I don't bother shutting everything down. I keep multiple computers running on it. I keep studio lights running. No, not the studio lights. I'm sorry. We do let those shut off. Those use a lot of power. I keep my cameras, all kinds of things, uploads, networks working equipment, all that stuff on the battery, and it goes for 12 to 14 hours at least. And so that's a really great fix for that problem. We've never had an outage that came close to that. And if you are coming close to that, you're pushing 12 hours, chances are one, you've, you've heard something from the power company and you have some kind of estimate, like it's a major disaster, we're gonna be out for days, which we've never had that happen here, but in theory, it could happen. Or you know it's about to be fixed, don't worry, whatever. That gives you time to run out and buy a generator. Have a generator and make the decision to turn it on. If we did have a generator, never once would we have hooked it up since we were here, which is why we don't feel any pressure to go and get one. Why have one? It's never going to come up. Now, of course, I'm not a call center worker, so maybe if I was, I may feel the pressure to just have that comfort that I would not have to worry about it. But in reality, if I was going to be pushing that kind of outage time frame. If I've gone through an entire work shift, remember, this would mean that the power went off one day and I was going into the next. Any given work day, I would have the entire work day covered by the battery. If the power goes out when I'm not working, of course, I would shut everything down and wait for the power to come back on. Plus, keep in mind, if you're like me and can work from a Mac, just as an example, your computer might do this too, even if you're not on a Mac, I get about 12 to 20 hours real runtime on my MacBook Air after the main battery dies. So if I get 12 hours, maybe more, from my house battery and I get 12 to 20 hours from my MacBook Air and I only have either of them powered up when I need to use them, I easily can run two or three days of full time, 40 hour an hour, 40 hour a week work without depleting the batteries. That's an insane amount of time to keep working. Now, the laptop won't necessarily help you with phones. It depends what you're using for phones. But a lot of people who are doing call center work are either using their laptop for their phones or they're using a cell phone for their phones. In all those cases, I can charge those things off of the battery. And once the battery depletes, I have the full runtime of those devices after that is depleted. If you're working on a desktop like I do for most things, that's only going to last as long as that main battery in your house. That's when you're going to want a generator. In each of these cases, I also have the capability of going somewhere, such as a coffee shop or a play, one of the restaurants on the beach, where people have a generator and plugging in my devices and charging them there while I'm getting food or whatever. Of course, here people cook without electricity a lot of the time, so you may be able to keep cooking and doing other things at home without a problem. So there's a couple practical things you're able to do, even if you were to have massive outages here, that you would be able to stay running for days, potentially with a little bit of planning, a little bit of doing the correct things for your office at home. And I'm not saying you have to get a Mac, I'm not saying you have to do it a specific way. I'm saying that there are tried and true mechanisms that make home office work super reliable for these types of events. But in the United States where power outages are when they happen, which are infrequent, potentially weeks at a time, such as Houston or Dallas, where we had it because of a uh, uh, winter storm, or ice storms in New York, I've had it go for weeks at a time, rolling blackouts that can be really major. Without those big events here in Nicaragua, the biggest ones we get are generally just in a few hour range, and even those are quite rare. We're often having outages all the time of just 30 seconds to maybe five minutes. Uh, even a tiny battery is gonna allow you to ride through most of those without a blip. And as long as you have a real battery, there's no drop of phone calls. That was a concern. But no, it doesn't do that. If you have a drop, that means you didn't have a battery take over. Now, you do need to have your networking equipment so your internet doesn't drop, and you need an internet provider that has its own power supply as well. So here in the region of Nicaragua that we're in, if you're on Claro or Tigo and we have a major power outage, they're going to lose power. But Teco, the fiber business carrier here, does not. They will stay up and running, partially because they use a lot less power because of the technology they use, but also they're a business service and they make sure they stay up and running. So we've not ever had an issue where the internet went out because the power was out even for an extended period of time. Of course, none of our periods of time are that extended. So if it was out for days, maybe the internet would go out too, but we've not experienced that. So by having the right internet and the right setup in your home, which is very minimal effort, you can be significantly protected against power outages, whether you want to be able to stay in your house and run indefinitely because you have a generator and a good battery, or you have smaller batteries, you have laptops, and you're willing to go to a cafe and charge up a little bit. If you had a MacBook like me and uh, no battery at home whatsoever, you'd still be able to work an eight-hour day, five days a week, 
forever, as long as I was willing to go to a restaurant or cafe or whatever, at some point to charge up each day. And really, it would just have to be every other day. So often when people are looking at doing a home office, and this could be for their own business or something like this, where you're simply working from home, we often see that people are just phoning it in with their home office setups. They're like, ah, I can just work from a corner of my bedroom or I can put a little desk in the living room. Of course, if you live alone, this gets to be a different equation. But even then, I find that having my own dedicated office space, I always have from the time I was about uh, 23, 24 years old. I Actually, before that, actually when I was 19 is the first time when I had my own apartment and we made sure I had a separate office space in the house. I guess I've always had one gone, going back a really long time. That's near nearly 30 years, having that dedicated office space where you can set everything out for the purpose of doing work and not have to put it away at the end of the day, not having to switch on and off between different things, not having it invading your non-work time, not having your non-work time invading your workspace, being able to go there and show people, look, I'm in my office, treat it like I'm at work. These things are important. Everyone has different aspects of this that will end up mattering to them. But this entire idea of make sure you have proper uh, networking, proper power, proper power supplies, proper facilities facilities, simple, simple things, things that we say to small businesses every day. These are minimum requirements for any basic IT in any business. They apply to your home office as well. Don't skimp on those. Make sure you have a good desk and a good working space. Make sure you have good light, comfortable chair, uh, a good computer, a computer that makes sense for your needs. Make sure you have good power supply on that. Make sure you have good networking equipment. Make sure you have good security. Make sure you're keeping it patched and up to date. Do the very simple things, right? Treat your home office as important and you will easily have protections and the ability to work and do things like call center work very easily, even from places like Nicaragua that feel like they'll be extra hard. Now, the power here is ideal for working from home because it is so easy to mitigate problems like short-term outages like we have here in Nicaragua. That's the most important thing. Yes, Nicaragua has more outages than the United States, but the United States has longer outages. Long outages can easily become insurmountable because you're dealing with a level of heat or cold or uh, depleting batteries or depleting fuel that you may not be able to easily get over. And uh, having lived through that multiple times, I totally understand why that happens. But here in Nicaragua, we never have those kinds of outages. We always have simple ways to mitigate it beyond the fact that it's just short outages that you can easily ride through, even if there's a lot of them, the fact that you had five minutes yesterday, five minutes today, five minutes tomorrow, those things don't impact you at all because your battery just absorbs it and it just fixes itself. But if you had all of those accumulated into one long outage at the end of the year, that long outage would cause you to lose your job. So it's a completely different thing because it has a different pattern. But because of the lower cost of living, you also have options that people don't generally think about. All those people in Houston who were unable to go anywhere because they were in a total disaster area, lost everything for a huge area. They couldn't go to a cafe and get around the problem. They couldn't find a restaurant with a generator. They couldn't drive to the next town. But here in Nicaragua, that would be almost impossible to not be able to do. If you're here in Leon, as an example, it's only two hours away to go to Managua, a totally different zone, where even if we had a disaster and all the power and all the internet was out here, they would have power and internet there. Or we could go up 45 minutes to the north to Chinandega, same thing. And because of the low cost of living, it's much more affordable to one, get there easily, and two, just go rent a hotel room or get a hostel and, and stay in a cafe during the day and do work that way. There's really easy ways to mitigate things, simply because of the geographic realities of being in Nicaragua. So from these perspectives, these exact concerns are actually reasons why Nicaragua dramatically outperforms the United States in reliability for these specific things. And of course, internet plays into this as well. In the United States, like anywhere, there's a certain reliability uh, risk with your internet provider. And the same thing here in Nicaragua, we have a risk too. But Having a good one like Teco here, we have seen that our reliability is very similar to that of the good providers in the U.S. Good providers for us included Verizon when they had uh, their Fios service. We had basically no outages with 10 years working with them. Optimum in New York City, really good reliability. There's a number of providers that are quite good. It's also a number that are quite bad. Same thing here in Nicaragua. You've got really good ones and really bad ones. The bad ones might be fine. If you're just at home and it's just a consumer service, you're just worried about watching Netflix and you're willing to, you know, wait a little while to watch Netflix because there's an outage, no big deal, save a bunch of money, great. But if you want to work from home, yeah, you're going to spend probably still less than you would spend in the United States, but you'll have to spend closer to it because you want highly reliable fiber options like Teco. 
but they exist. So make sure you're moving into an area that does have Teco. Someone on my channel just said they're looking at a place that doesn't have that option. And so that's very unfortunate. I had no idea that somewhere in the region of San Juan del Sur would be so off the grid that rural communities, rural, super poor communities all throughout the country have fiber everywhere. But in the San Juan del Sur area, because of the enclaves, they actually have areas with no real internet access. That's nuts, but it's very, very isolated to that little area. But basically, if you're being anywhere in normal Nicaragua, you're going to have access to carriers like Teco, and you're going to have really good, reliable fiber internet. And of course, if you have any concerns, you can get a backup line. Claro, Tigo, or others, Kutel, are available, and you could and you could use your cell phone as a hotspot. Lots of ways that you can fail over and make sure that that uh, takes up the slack should that go out as well. Plus, if you have a good uh, carrier like Tigo or Claro with your wireless, I'm talking wired at home for the example I just gave, but I also have both on my cell phone, I'm able to continue taking my office calls from both of those carriers. So at any given moment, with only having my cell phone and cell service and having Teco at the house, I have three different carriers, Tigo, Claro, and Teco, that I can switch between to take my office calls. So my risk of losing my ability to make calls, now lots of things will get super slow, but calls do not require very much, especially if you have a good professional phone system. But uh, because they, they've just gotten so good that they do not need the kind of bandwidth that they did in the past. People often imagine that phone calls are one of those things that's very challenging for the internet to handle, but in reality, they're one of the easiest things for it to handle. So if you're able to do basically anything, you'll be able to make calls. The one thing that people don't think about well, I guess there's two. One is latency. No one ever talks about that at all. That's the biggest thing that affects you. The other thing that does affect you, but normally is so fast that it doesn't matter, is your upload speed. The one thing that will never matter is your download speed, and that's the thing everyone talks about because it's easy to just give you a number that doesn't matter. It's way easier to sell things based on things that don't matter than on reality. This is life. Customers rarely do their research and actually look for what matters in anything. Same reason that cars talk about horsepower, because it's easy to talk about and it doesn't mean anything uh, to the end user in reality. So for a lot of reasons, Nicaragua really does shine when it comes to call center work. It is great how far it is and where it is located compared to North America. It is great how good its power supply is in the ways that matter for doing call center type work. It is great that there is available widely quality internet that basically never goes down is very reliable. Uh, it has the low cost of living and it is generally protected from extreme weather events, all of which come together to make it a very reliable and low cost location where Yes, there are still things you need to mitigate, but the ability to mitigate those things is so much easier than mitigating them somewhere else like the US or Canada, just much of the world. The things you need to do to mitigate them are generally quite available and cost effective and flexible here. Whether it's because of the low cost of living or just wide availability of things like generators, it is so easy to go out and solve these problems that that's what people do. And that is is what really matters at the end of the day. The ability to make a reliable space for you to work where you're able to much more reliably, at much lower cost, do the same work you would be able to do in the United States without being effectively detectable as being somewhere else is pretty extreme. Now, of course, you get your best results when you have a company that embraces the fact that you're gonna be trying to do an even better job, that you're supplying the best possible office and giving them the best possible service. Not every American company is so dedicated to good business and just being good to their employees, but those who actually care are going to love that you're working in Nicaragua because there's no downsides for them, only upsides. And no downsides for you, only upsides. Everyone wins when you do this as long as there's no mitigating factors that make it different than the norm. But for normal businesses and normal workers, this is kind of a perfect scenario. They're happy because you're happy and your being happy makes you do a better job. It's a feedback loop of improvement and happiness that just keeps going. So while some jobs are going to hate the fact that you're happy and your manager is not for whatever reason and they're going to be angry and jealous, well, that's just a toxic toxic environment, and that's unfortunate, but toxicity is its own problem. When it comes to real business, when it comes to just doing a good job, Nicaragua is simply going to be one of many steps that you can take to do the best job possible. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.